Welcome back everyone, Patrick here. Moving on to the next video dealing with factor form quadratics. So what we have to do is we have to take each of these quadratics here and we have to sketch them and we also have to label the x-intercepts and the vertex. And I'm actually gonna go through a couple of videos where we're gonna be sketching factored form quadratics because there's different kinds of cases that you can run into. So this is gonna be one of a few videos. You could think of it as a series. So notice that these are all in factored form. So starting with part A, we got y equals x plus four in brackets times x minus two. Now there's a specific process that I go through to graph these. I actually first find the x-intercepts and the vertex and then I graph it. So let's start off with finding the x-intercepts. Now, just as a quick review, Remember, in the overview video, we mentioned that's going to be the general factored form of a quadratic, and the m and the n are going to be the x-intercepts, right? And then the midpoint between the x-intercepts is going to be the x value of the vertex or the axis of symmetry. So the axis symmetry is gonna be the midpoint between M and N or the x-intercepts, so we can just add them and divide it by two. So axis of symmetry, the x value of the vertex, those are the same thing. And then once we have that x value, we could plug it into the actual function to get the corresponding y value of the vertex. And then once we have the vertex, the coordinates of the vertex, and then the x-intercepts, that's enough to draw a fairly accurate graph. So that's the process that I'm gonna be going through. Now, for any x-intercept of any kind of graph, what's the y value always gonna be? It's always gonna be zero. So if you wanna show algebraically how we get the x-intercepts, you could also do that, and your teacher may require you to do this step. So you can just get them by looking at it, right, because it's always gonna be that M and N value. So notice here, one of the x-intercepts is gonna be positive two, and then this over here, it's x plus four, so we could rewrite as x minus negative four, right? It has to be x minus the x-intercept, and so the other x-intercept is gonna be negative four. It's always gonna be that opposite sign over here. But in case your teacher wants you to actually show algebraically how we get these values, this is how you do it because for an x-intercept, the y value is always gonna be zero. And then you could think here, well, how can we make this whole thing zero? Well, one of these brackets can be zero, meaning that either the x plus four bracket can equal zero or the x minus two bracket can equal zero. So this is gonna happen at an x value of negative four if we isolate for that x. And then over here, it's gonna happen at an x value of Two. Okay, so that's how we can get the x-intercepts to negative four algebraically. And it's not going to be in this video, but uh, in other examples we're going to go through in the next couple of videos, you're going to see that it's not always going to be in this format, and I mentioned this in the overview video as well, where you're going to have x minus something. Sometimes you're going to have factors like 3x plus 2 for example. And then just looking at this here, it's tougher to see what x value is gonna make this bracket gonna be zero. What's the x-intercept gonna be if it's in this kind of format? And so doing it algebraically like this, when does three x plus two equal zero? Well, that's gonna happen when three x is negative two, and then when x is equal to negative two over three, right? Isolating for x algebraically like this allows us to get that x intercept, okay? If you have a factor like this, the x-intercept is going to be negative 2 over 3. And it's a little tougher to see that just by looking at it like this, right? When there's nothing in front of the x and we're just isolating for the x, we're just taking that opposite sign, that's the x-intercept. But the factors aren't always going to be smooth like that, right? So sometimes this algebraic process is fairly helpful with... Um, with more complex factors, and we're gonna go over those type of factors in other videos. But for all of these, 
there's only just the x by itself in the factors. Okay, so let's, uh, I'm gonna write out the characteristics here below each one. So we got the x uh, intercepts, that's happening at negative four and two. So we have the x-intercepts, now we can find the axis of symmetry, which is gonna be the midpoint between the intercepts. So what we do is we just add them together, negative four plus two divided by two, which would be negative four plus two is negative two, divided by two would give us negative one. It doesn't matter which order you go in, so we could have also took two and added negative four, just be careful with the brackets here, two plus negative four is like two minus four, which would also give us negative two. Then dividing by two, we get negative one. So we know that the vertex is gonna have an x value of negative one, right? Negative one is between negative four and two, right? From negative four to negative one, it's three units. From negative one to two, it's also three units. So we know the x value of the vertex is gonna be negative one, and then if we want the corresponding y value, what we can do is we could just plug in that x value of negative one for the x values in the equation. So let's write out the equation over here, and then plug in that x value of negative one of the vertex. And so we'd end up negative one plus four is three, this ends up being negative three, three times negative three gives us negative nine, like that. So that's the corresponding y value of the vertex, like that, negative one, negative nine. Another thing you can get, another point that's uh, fairly easy to get and fairly quick if you wanna add even more uh, detail to the graph is you could get the y-intercept. So for an x-intercept, the y value is always gonna be zero, while for uh, a y-intercept, the x value is always gonna be zero. So we could plug in zero for the x values, and we'd end up with four times negative two, which would give us negative eight. So we'd have a y value, or a y-intercept of negative eight. So that's a quick, other point that you can get on the graph if you want more detail, okay? And so now we have enough points or enough detail to make a graph over here. So let's try to make this as accurate as, accurate as possible. So I'll have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then we'll have, um, there's no positive values here, so let's just go one, two, three, four, and over here we'll need a little bit more. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think it goes all the way to nine, right? Negative one, negative nine. So the x-intercepts are negative four, which would be over here, and positive two, which would be right there. So this coordinate is negative four and zero. This coordinate here is two and zero. And then we'll have a y-intercept at zero, negative eight, which would be like here. And then we'll have a vertex at negative one, negative nine, negative one, negative nine, like that. And then from here, you could tell what the shape is gonna be like, right? So the vertex parabola would end up looking like that. Okay, and you could grab this on Desmos as well. You could check your work and you would end up getting this. And you'd see that it has the points negative four and zero, two and zero, negative one, negative nine, right? We labeled the x-intercepts and the vertex. And then the y-intercept we just added over here. Okay, it's a good point to add just to make sure that your graph is making sense. Because sometimes you might do an algebraic error whether finding the intercepts or maybe finding the vertex. So getting that y-intercept, like if we got a y-intercept up here, right, how are we gonna have a vertex here, x-intercepts here, and then a y-intercept up here, right? You can't really draw a parabola that would allow for that to happen. And then if you get something like that where things aren't making sense, then you know you did a calculation error somewhere and you can go back and check your work. But here, everything makes sense fairly 
smoothly, right? Even if we didn't draw this or get this y-intercept coordinate, when we draw the parabola, we know it's going to go through a point that's at least near that area right there. Okay, so that's my process personally that I go through when graphing these. So then moving on to part B, I'll just erase the whole graph here. And then I'm going to erase all this, give myself some room. So for part B, same sort of thing. So let's find the x-intercepts first. So how do we find them algebraically? Well, the y value for an x-intercept is going to be 0. So we'll have 0. And then there's like a negative here. It's like a negative 1 in front. x plus 1, x plus 6. Now, no matter what is over here, this a value, it doesn't affect the x-intercept. So if I show you this, for example, on a graph, let's say we have a parabola that has maybe like these intercepts like that. Well, you can have another parabola that has the exact same intercepts. And let's say it maybe looks like this, right? Notice that both of these parabolas, they have the exact same x-intercepts, but the shape is totally different. And so that would be an example of two parabolas having the same x-intercepts. So they're going to have those same two brackets, those same factors, but the a value is going to be different. And sometimes it could even be flipped. So you could have a parabola that goes like that, that opens down, still going through the same intercepts. And actually, that's going to be this parabola because it has a negative a value. So it's actually going to be opening down. And we'll see that in the graph. But just want to make a heads up that this a value doesn't affect these x-intercepts over here. Right? It affects the shape of the graph, but we can have an infinite amount of parabolas with the same x-intercepts. So going back to finding the x-intercepts over here, we basically ignore this because this is like a negative 1 here. So that's always going to be there no matter what. So what x values make these brackets equal to 0? Right? x equals negative 1 x equals negative 6. Those two x values right there would make the whole thing equal to 0. If we plug in negative 1, this bracket would be 0. We'll have a number times 0 times a number, which would just give us 0. If we plug in negative 6 for the x values, negative 1 will have a number here, negative 5, and then over here we'll have 0. So multiplying everything, it would make the y value 0. So these two x values make the whole equation whole quadratic, the y value equal to zero. So those are the two um, x-intercepts. So let's write the points out like that. And now that we have the x-intercepts, we could find the axis of symmetry. What we could do is we could add them up and divide by 2. And then 1 plus negative 6 is like 1 minus, or a negative 1 plus negative 6 is like negative 1 minus 6. This positive negative turned into a negative, divided by 2. So this would be negative 7 over 2, which is actually a decimal. It's negative 3.5. I'm actually going to keep it as a fraction. So the vertex is going to be the, y, uh, the x value, at least, of the vertex is going to be at negative 7 over 2 or negative 3.5. And then if we want the corresponding y value, we would plug in um, negative 7 over 2 into the equation. So we'd have y equals negative, and then we'll have negative 7 over 2 plus 1 times negative 7 over 2 plus 6, like that. And in case they want the vertex in fractions, I'm going to work with fractions over here. If your teacher allows you to work with decimals, you can work with decimals as well. But fractions are tougher to work with, so that's what I'm going to work with. So over here, we would just do plus 2 over 2. We need a common denominator to add these. Same thing over here. Uh, this would be, what, 12 over 2? It's like over 1. Multiply this by 2. Multiply this by 2 to get 12 over 2. So we'd end up with negative. 
uh, negative 5 over 2, and then over here we'd have uh, positive 5 over 2. Negative 7 plus 12 is positive 5. Negative 7 plus 2 gives us negative 5. And then multiplying these, uh, let's multiply these first. So we'll have the negative on the outside. Then we'll have negative 5 times positive 5 would give us negative 25. 2 times 2 gives us 4. And then it's like negative 1 times negative 25 over 4 would give us positive 25 over 4. And then the decimal of this would be 6.25, like that. Okay, so the vertex is either at negative 7 over 2 and 25 over 4, right, in fraction form, or in decimal form, it would be at negative 3.5 and 6.25, like that. So two different formats that the vertex can be in. Okay, so I'm just gonna do any kind of fractions we're working with over the next couple of videos. In this entire section, I'll work with fractions as well in case your teacher wants it in fraction format, or maybe it's gonna be a multiple choice test, and then one of the answers is gonna be in this format and not in this one, right? So you have to know how to be able to get this. And then from here, this is actually enough to make a fairly accurate graph, but let's just get that y-intercept to be really sure that we're doing the right thing. So how do we get a y-intercept? Well, we plug in zero for x. And so we'd end up with negative, and then zero plus one is one, zero plus six is six, negative one times one times six would give us negative. Six. So we'll have a y intercept, let's write it over here, of negative six, so that would be at zero, and negative six like that. Okay, so now let's plot all these points on a graph and see if everything makes sense, if everything checks out. So we'll go. One, two, three, four, five, six. Then we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then we'll go one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we'll go one, two, three. Okay, I'm sort of adjusting these graphs here on the whiteboard depending on what coordinates we're working with. So let's label the x intercepts first negative one and zero, negative six and zero. So that would be here and then over here. Right, so we got negative six and zero, then we got negative one and zero. And then we'll have the y-intercept at zero and negative six, which would be down here. We don't have to label the y-intercept, but I'll label it anyways. And then we'll have negative 3.5, 6.25. Getting the decimals, I think it's easier for graphing, okay, versus here. It's kind of tough to see with fractions where it's going to be. But with decimals, negative 3.5, well, 3 is here. Negative 3 is here, negative 4 is here, so it's going to be in the middle there. And then 6.25, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then so just above that right there. And then you can label this as, um, as decimals or fractions. I'll just label it as the fractions. But again, your teacher may just allow you to use decimals. But even if your teacher requires fractions, I do recommend changing it to decimals when you're graphing because it's a little bit easier to make sense of where the points are going to be on the graph, at least for me personally. So from here, notice that it does make sense because we're starting at the vertex. It has to go through that x-intercept. It also has to go through that x-intercept. So we know that if we keep extending this, the y-intercept is going to be somewhere down here, right? If this is going to keep going forever, it's got to cross that y-axis at some point, and it's actually crossing it at that y-value of negative 6. So it makes sense that the y-intercept would be down here, okay? Would it make sense if we got a y-intercept of like positive 3 over here? Okay, because how is it going to go through 
that y-intercept and through this x-intercept. That wouldn't make sense. It would have to go through that y-intercept there, then the x-intercept would have to be positive. Okay, so it wouldn't make sense in that case. But in this case, it's going through there first and then going through there. So it does make sense on, um, on the graph. Okay, and it also makes sense that it's opening down, as I mentioned before, because that A value is negative. It's actually negative one. So we could be pretty confident going through everything that we got the correct graph. And then finally, part C, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna erase all this here so we can have some room to write out the um, characteristics. And so, same process as usual. So let's start off with the x-intercepts, finding the x-intercepts that's gonna happen at a y value of zero. When are we gonna get a y value of zero? Well, either when this bracket is equal to zero or when this bracket is equal to zero. So it's gonna happen at an x value of five or an x value of negative seven, like that. So the x-intercepts are gonna be at five and zero and negative seven and zero. That's gonna be the coordinates of them. Now let's find the vertex. Let's start off with the X value of the vertex, which is just the axis of symmetry. We can add the intercepts, divide by two, positive, negative, turn into a negative, uh, negative two divided by two, which would give us negative one. So actually the same x value of the vertex that we got in part a. So we'll have negative one for the axis of symmetry or the x value of the vertex. And then if we wanna get the uh, y value of the vertex, we could just plug in that negative one into the actual function. So we'll have two, negative one minus five, negative one plus seven. So we'll have two, negative six, positive six. Um, yes, that makes sense. So we'll have uh, negative 12, negative 12 times six would give us negative 72, like that. So a fairly large negative y value for the vertex. And the reason why is because of this two here. That's what's really, remember, what does this do? It vertically stretches the parabola, okay? So it makes it, a lot taller, quote unquote, right? It makes it less wide and it stretches vertically, hence why we're getting bigger numbers in this case. Uh, let me just double check the algebra here. Yeah, it's all good. And then let's get the, um, the y-intercept as well. Again, it's not required in this question, but I do recommend getting it it's, uh, it's not too bad of a process to get, and it's going to just make us more confident with our graph. All right, so the y-intercept in this case is negative 70. So if we graph this, um, we'll have... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five. And then the y axis, let's go by 10. So we'll do negative 10, negative 20, negative 30, negative 40, negative 50, negative 60, negative 70, negative 80, like that, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. So let's label these five and zero. That's going to be over here, um, negative seven and zero right there. And then we'll have zero, negative 70, which would be over here. And then we'll have negative one, negative 72, negative one, negative 72. That's going to be like right there. That's where the vertex is going to be. So sorry, I forgot to label these. Five and zero, and then let's label the vertex, negative one, negative 72, and then the y-intercept here is zero and negative 70. And again, 
when we graph this starting at the vertex, notice it's making sense. It has to go through this x-intercept, so notice it's going to pass the y-axis at some point over here. So it makes sense that that would be at negative 70 right there. Okay, if we got like a y-intercept up here, it wouldn't make sense to have a vertex here and then an x-intercept there. Okay, there's no way that it could pass the y-axis somewhere up there. So this is making sense, which is nice. And then it goes through the other x-intercept and we get a parabola like that. Okay, so that's my process for graphing factored form quadratics. Again, we're going to do a couple of more videos where we go through different cases where I mentioned we're going to have maybe more complex factors to work with and other cases that you might run into. But generally, this is the process I go through.